<laughs> I hate words. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> words suck. <laughs> if I wanted to read, I'd go to school. Well, I didn't have to go to school to do it. I sure did plenty of reading there, Beavis. Not recently, like 25 years ago, man. I didn't read these recently. I just like looked it up in the index. Was like, I remember that part. Well, hello and welcome back to Dunking. In this episode, I'm going to do something that's been a long time coming. We're going to cover the number one argument against Graham Hancock. That's actually not really an argument at all. It's a straw man. It's a crock and duck. It's tilting at windmills. And there's three reasons really that I'm doing this. The number one reason is so that I don't have to keep partially explaining it over and over again in almost every video or every third video anyway, and then feel like I'm not doing a good enough job, but feel like it needs pointed out over and over again. So now I can just uh, highlight it and send you all here. Second reason is for you debunkers out there that want to come and get us Hancock idiots or Pyramidiots or Hancockians, whatever the, the technical term is for us. For those of you who want to come and come after us, you probably should know this shit right off the bat or you're just going to look really stupid. And then, of course, for uh, us Pyramidiots, us Hancockians, us cult members of the almighty Wu, uh, this is so that you can tell when those debunker types are just stupid and don't even know what the hell they're talking about right out the gate. They come at you with this, they might know their own personal stuff. I'm sure they know their own field. If they're an archaeologist or whatever, I'm sure they know whatever the hell they talk about in their own field. But they don't know anything about Hancock's position. Otherwise, they wouldn't be telling you all this crap. So without further ado, here we go. I can't really blame the skeptic types for not knowing this because in Hancock's most popular works, Fingerprints of the Gods and Ancient Apocalypse, he never really mentions this in detail. He touches on it in Fingerprints of the Gods, but he never really goes into that in Ancient Apocalypse. He kind of assumes that his audience knows, probably because so many of the people watching that have listened to him on Joe Rogan. But if you haven't like deep dove into his work, this is the kind of thing that you're probably not going to be aware of. And it's going to be really painfully obvious when you start going to debunk him because you're going to be doing it all wrong. And this straw man argument's a little clunky to paraphrase, but the gist of it is we know that some of these places were built at way different times. We know that Sesquan was built at a way different time than Giza, which was built at a way different time than Angkor. So what in the hell are you doing trying to put all three of these together and lump it under one culture? That's just stupid. Certainly don't go back to no 10,500 BC. What the hell are you even talking about? Get out of here with that crazy woo. That's not at all his position. Now, if you go back to Fingerprint of the Gods, all the way back in 95, one of the things that he says in there is, That question was still on my mind when Robert Bavall arrived. After exchanging a few chilly pleasantries about the weather, a cold desert wind was blowing across the plateau, I asked him, how do you account for the 8,000 year gap in your correlations? Gap? Yes, shafts that seem to have been aligned in 2450 BC and a site plan that maps star positions in 10,450 BC. This is discussing the pyramids at Giza, by the way, and he has a couple of explanations, but it's the second one that's important to us, so we'll skip down the page a bit. Okay, that's one explanation, but the second explanation, which I personally favor, and which I think the geological evidence also supports, is that the whole Giza necropolis was developed and built up over an enormously long period of time. I think it's more than possible that the site was originally planned and laid out around 10,450 BC so that its geometry would reflect the skies as they looked then, but the work was completed and the shafts of the Great Pyramid aligned around 2,450 BC. And as you just heard, he's basically saying that the pyramids were built in two steps, and the first one was like 10,500 BC, and the second one was about 2,500 BC. That was his take all the way back in Fingerprints of the Gods. Now, if you go to his next book, Message of the Sphinx, it may have been the case that the ground plan to the three great pyramids was physically established in 10,500 BC, perhaps in the form of low platforms. Or it may have been that precise astronomical records from that epoch were preserved and handed down to the astronomer priests of the Heliop Heliopolis by the followers of Horus. Either way, we are still reasonably certain the pyramids themselves were largely built in 2,500 BC when Egyptologists say they were. We are also sure, however, that the site was already vastly ancient by then and had been the domain of the followers, the sages, the senior ones, for the previous 8,000 years. 
We think the evidence suggests a continuous transmission of advanced scientific and engineering knowledge over that huge gulf of time, and thus the continuous presence in Egypt, from the Paleolithic into the dynastic period, of a highly enlightened and sophisticated individuals, those shadily, shadowy Akhus said in the text to have possessed a divine knowledge and blah 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 blah. You get the point. Once again, you can see they're discussing the pyramids being built in two stages, the first stage being much older than the second. He actually rolls that back even more by the time you get to Heaven's Mirror, which was wrote in 1998. And by then, he has this to say. The origins of Giza are shrouded in mystery, but there is no doubt that major developments took place there around 2500 BC and that the ancient Egyptian god kings, notably the 4th dynasty pharaohs Khufu, Khafre, and Menakaru, are intimately connected with these developments. In a like fashion, the origins at Angkor are shrouded in mystery, but there is no doubt that major developments took place there between the 9th and 13th centuries, and that Khmer Dvarjurus, such as Jayavarman I and blah blah blah, were intimately connected to these developments. A little further down the page, it discusses his origins, and it goes on to say, A matter of which there is no dispute, however, is a later inscription-style hymn as having been the descended from a perfectly pure race of kings, an epithet that would frequently applied in ancient Egypt to the followers of Horus, who were thought of as superior beings who produced the race of pharaohs. We are also told that Jayaravan had, been king, had become king in order to save his people. This phrase is part of the standard language of the Osirian rebirth cult. Of course, there can be no suggestion of any kind of direct influence. The worship of Osiris had been dead for centuries before Angkor rose to prominence, and there is very little of ancient Egypt still left intact at the end of the Roman occupation in AD 395 had long been washed away after Egypt's conversion to Islam around AD 650, still more than 150 years before Jayavarman II took the throne in far-off Cambodia. Yet the impossibility of a direct influence does not rid us of the suspicion that some sort of indirect underground connection could exist between the stellar temples and pyramids of Angkor and the stellar temples and pyramids of Giza. And obviously we wonder whether the same connection might have been at work in ancient Mexico too. Now I know you can critique him and say, oh look at him changing his position, but if, if you're at all a fan of the scientific method and you're going to critique him for changing his position when he got new evidence, this is probably the wrong place for you probably run along to one of those more, more polarized, less thinking channels. There's plenty of them out there. Both sides of the fence are full. He also discusses the importance to his hypothesis of navel stones or omphalos, I believe they're pronounced. They had one at the Oracle at Delhi and they've got other ones in inscriptions here and there throughout his books and whatnot. And he talks about it to a degree. Easter Island was called Eyes Looking at Heaven, but it was also called the Navel of the World, a name that was surprisingly bestowed on it by the god King Hotu Matau himself. What is strange, as we shall see in Part 5, is that it shares this name with Cusco, meaning Navel, the incredible megalithic capital of the Inca Empire, high up in the Peruvian Andes. Frequently such navels of the earth also prove to have associations with meteorites, stones fallen from heaven. Many will have their own navel stone or sunstone or foundation stone, which will sometimes be accompanied by a tradition of a rod or pillar sunk in the earth. Related ideas occur in ancient Israel in the connection of a sacred city of Jerusalem. The Holy Land is the central point of the surface of the earth, Jerusalem is the central point of Palestine, and the temple is situated in the center of the Holy City. In the sanctuary itself is the Ark of the Covenant occupies the center, built on the foundation stone, which is thus the center of the earth. That was from Heaven's Mirror. The message of the Sphinx we see... The primeval mound identified with the Great Pyramid and with the natural mound of rock that is incorporated into the foundations of that monument is envisaged in the pyramid text as being a place of once of birth and death and a place of rebirth. These ideas fit well with the ancient Egyptian rituals of awakening Osiris and attaining astral immortality. So basically, his hypothesis is that at the end of the Younger Dryas, when Atlantis got smoked and they went out into the world to make sure that everybody knew that they were there in the future, they set up these sites that would be holy sites, it would be sacred sites, it would be world navels, they would be important to the people for a very, very, very long time. Built on over succession many times throughout history, but also somehow, somewhere, there's some secret knowledge, if it's in the myth, or if it's in a hidden chamber under the Sphinx, or who knows what. But there's some place that the people get this kind of activated, this knowledge gets turned on, and all of a sudden these sacred sites become large megalithic structures and it might be in Angkor not very long ago at all by comparison or it might be in Giza much much further back or it might be in Szechuan. The idea is these were not built by the ancients, these were not built by the Atlanteans, excuse me, they were built by people that came much much further. 
So if you're watching somebody debunk Ancient Apocalypse and they say, oh, Ganong Padang has lava tubes in the bottom of it. It's not a real chamber. It's just lava tubes. That means this is a nothing burger. That really shows that they don't know Hancock's basic position because that's exactly the kind of place that would be chosen as a world naval to last thousands of years until that knowledge was turned on. If you want to say that you don't agree with that idea of knowledge being passed down through thousands of years through whatever esoteric means or stuffed in a chamber under the Sphinx or whatnot, that's completely fine and that's a perfectly valid position to take and I would have a discussion with you, but that's fine. The thing is, at least you're actually addressing his real arguments instead of tilting at windmills. And I hope that clears some stuff up and you found this useful. And let me know down in the comments what uh, other things you would like to see me discussed in uh, Graham Hancock's work. I want to keep making these kinds of videos addressing the, the main arguments against him that people get wrong. Because eventually, hopefully, it'll like distill this conversation into something that's less... But... Uh, Anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe and click the buttons and social media links. Oh, 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 S Stefan responded to me on Twitter. Yeah, no shit. Well, because there was some other guy talking to me and I was arguing with him, but, but, but yeah, it's crazy, huh? Have a good night.